Hey guys, Jackdaw here. So quite a while back in my Andraste Descendant Protagonist Theory video, I discussed the idea of me doing full lore videos. I delved into how I'd like to do them, but realistically, I don't really have any accurate footage that could really showcase the story as I tell it. And that's always been a pet peeve of mine. You know, if I'm talking about something, I want to be able to show it to you via cinematics or gameplay, just basic footage. So why am I saying this now? And now why am I also doing a sort of lore video, even though I'm opposed to the idea? Well, I really, really want to tell y'all the tale of Corypheus, just in an attempt to at least try and redeem the view that we already have of him, thanks to his weak villain direction in Dragon Age Inquisition. He once was such a remarkable and fascinating character, someone to be feared and reckoned with, but believe it or not, he was actually more like Solas, with his trickery and his schemes of mischief. So in an attempt to somewhat redeem any antagonistic qualities of Corypheus, today I'm going to tell the tale of the Magister's origin story as he sought the old god Dumat's favour, entering the Golden City and sharing his journey as he manipulated the other Magisters attempting to be the only one to receive Dumat's glory. The reason I started with sharing my pet peeve is basically because this might be a reality within this video. We don't have any footage of Corypheus back in his bachelor days, even if he did have a wife. We literally have next to nothing, so I really have to grasp at straws with the footage here and I do apologise for that. Basically, it's just all that swanky fan art. But without further ado, let's just get into this blighted tale already. And of course, if you want to read along with me, then be sure to check out this post on my blog. Again, every video is posted on my blog. And if you want to find more about the Jackdaw, it's a perfect place to read and bond with me. Only if you really want to. So just like splitting the veil, let's just get on with this. Corypheus was once a human magister of the Tevinter Imperium by the name of Cepheus Amaladis. He was the high priest of Dumat, the god of silence, and House Alamadis was considered mediocre, Cepheus middling, but he believed he himself was deserving of more. According to one of his slaves, whose words were somehow preserved in the third, ominous, Cepheus was never a cruel man, but the weakening of the temples and the loss of his followers had brought fear into his house. He discussed ways to return the people of Tevinter to the ways of the old gods. As a result, when Dumat started whispering to Cepheus in his dreams, promising to raise him to godhood if he entered the Fade to claim the Golden City, Cepheus heeded the call. Unable to accomplish this extraordinary feat on his own, he called on the other high priests of the old gods for help. So Cepheus took on the name of Corypheus, the conductor of the Choir of Silence, coordinating his efforts to achieve one of the most magical feats never accomplished before. The conductor became a obsessed with what he had heard, he shared the word of his god with other priests and acolytes of the silence, and they too became consumed with fulfilling the will of the gods. The first acolyte advised Corypheus that even with all their might they would not be able to reach the golden heart of the Fade, and they suggested an alliance with the high priest of Urthemiel, the architect of works of beauty, and so the conductor met in secret with the architect to tell him of Dumat's words. The architect found the idea of raising a mortal above the gods blasphemous, and refused to help Corypheus. However, it did intrigue him, and so he decided to speak about this with his own god, Urthemiel. The god of beauty then spoke to him and encouraged the architect to come to him in the Golden City so he could bestow the godhood upon the architect instead, and give him the designs to make Fadus into a paradise. And so the high priest of Dumat and Urthemiel decided to work together, each for their own agenda. However, the power of the conductor and the architect was still no match against the Golden City, and so they approached the remaining five of the Sidereal. Yes, got it right. Normally I say Sidereal, but nope, Sidereal, 10 points to Gryffindor. The remaining Magisters include the Watchman of Lusican, the Forge Writer of Toph, the Appraiser of Anderol, the Augur of Razakal, and the Madman of Zazakal. All of them craved the power of which Corypheus spoke, and so after seeking counsel with each of their chosen deity, they united under the pretense of helping Corypheus. But in reality, each wanted all the power for themselves. Of course, twas the hubris of man that usurped the heavens. A hundred acolytes were chosen to gather unimaginable amounts of lyrium and slaves beyond counting in preparation for the entering of the golden city. The lyrium and the blood sacrifices made the veil rip open in front of them and the high priests entered the realm of the spirits with pride unmatched. Tiny, 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 quick, quick, quick tinfoil theory here, but will Solas need to use blood magic to rip open the veil? Takes off tinfoil hat. The exact sequences of the events that followed did not survive to this day. Even Corypheus says it was all recorded incorrectly, but both the Andrastian Chantry and the Imperial Chantry have their own version of it, each changing the chant of light. Some sources, like the Andrastian Chantry, claim that the hubris of the Sidereal tainted the Golden City, turning it black and as punishment, the maker that won 
true god as opposed to the false old gods and the one true deity residing in the golden city. He cast them down and other sources state that the city was already tainted and black when the seven arrived and according to Corypheus they found no one in the city and instead the throne was already empty. In either instance the Sidereal returned to the realm of the mortals disappointed and without the powers that were promised them. They did however return with the taint which in turn gave them powers similar to those of the archdemons such as commands of tainted creatures like Darkspawn and Grey Wardens, shapeshifting and possession. It was around the time of their return when the first blight broke out and according to the Canticle of Silence upon the Magister's return the sky was burning, the contemporary Archon followed the path of the burning sky and reached the Magister's Sidereal. When confronted, they attacked him but did not harm him. The Archon tried to use magic to cleanse the tainted land but to no avail, he then called on the spirits of the Fade to grant him powers enabling him to defeat the Seven. He used his magic to scatter the Sidereal to the corners of Fadis and returned to Manrafis to await the first ever Blight. And sometime after, minus three or five ancient on the Chantry calendar, Dumat was killed by a group of Ander soldiers while he was on the run from a Warden offensive. But the celebrations were cut short when Dumat returned unarmed. In the years that followed, scholars learned that the Archdemon's death had only forced its soul to relocate into the body of the nearest Darkspawn or Grey Warden. Dumat was finally slain by Grey Wardens at the Battle of Silent Plains in minus two or three ancient. The Wardens having learned by that point that only a death blow dealt by one of their order would prevent the Archdemon's resurrection in a new host body. Records do not say who exactly gave up his soul to destroy Dumat, for many wardens struggled against him and the archdemon's very death froze slew seven or more of them. Following his defeat, Dumat's remains were kept at Weishaup Fortress. Senior warden Sashimari used Dumat's blood to trap Corypheus in the Vinmuk Mountains. She then destroyed the remains. The wardens initially hoped that they could use Corypheus as a weapon against the Darkspawn, but interrogation proved futile as any warden within the vicinity became mysteriously drawn to his influence and when removed from the area they had had forgotten anything prior and would be left dazed. This appears to be a type of call to anyone bearing the taint, similar to that emitted by the old gods, which draws Darkspawn and Wardens alike to his prison. When it became clear that no Warden could stand in his presence without being influenced by him, Warden Commander Danikin had the prison sealed to bind Corypheus in perpetuity, and during the early years of the Dragon Age, the seals keeping Corypheus locked began to weaken since no Warden could safely approach the prison. Warden Commander Larice approached a Ferelden apostate named Malcolm Hawk and forced him to use blood magic to strengthen the seals inside the prison. After Warden Commander Larice leaves on his calling, one of his senior wardens, Janenka, comes to believe that Corypheus is the key to ending the Blights and devises a plan to free him from his prison. She forces a faction of the Carter to drink Darkspawn blood, afflicting them with the taint and thus binding them to Corypheus. She then uses them to successfully lure Hawk to the prison as only Malcolm Hawk's blood could break the seals he'd set up. Trapped inside the prison, Hawk is forced to break the seals to escape and regardless of Hawk's intentions, Corypheus decides that they intended to bar his escape and attacks them. After a drawn out battle, Corypheus is defeated. However, just as Hawk delivers the final blow, Corypheus looks at the Reese Arjuninka and faintly smiles as Corypheus is struck down. The Warden can be seen shuddering before stumbling. Unbeknownst to Hawk or the Grey Wardens, Corypheus possesses the same ability as an Archdemon to transfer his entire essence through the taint and leaves the Grey Warden prison in the body of Janenka or Larisse. Free of the prison, Corypheus's mind eventually recovers and he is able to think clearly once more. Due to his experiences in the Black City, Corypheus comes to believe that both the old gods and the more recent maker are lies and resolves to end the search for religion completely. He decides to achieve this by attaining apophysis through returning to the black city and restoring the Tevinter Imperium to its former glory, finally creating a true deity capable of intervening in mortal affairs. And this is when Inquisition comes into play when Corypheus takes Solas's orb and becomes a one-noted twirly moustache bland as Fade antagonist. I've delved into a video talking about the disappointment that is Corypheus. However, However, regarding the story of Corypheus after Inquisition, well, we don't really know what happens to him except when you go into the Fade like that, you're going to be tossed. However, he could somehow come back, maybe forgetting his memories, maybe just remembering the Golden City. We could see him in the Fade again. I mean, it is what he wanted in the first place. I feel it would be good to see him again, so he could have some redeemable quality. But regarding the other Magisters, well, according to a Codex entry, a different Darkspawn question mark, <laughs> the Dwarves encountered three tall Darkspawns that met the very description of the Sidereal. Arguing over the failure of capturing the powers of the Golden City, as the story goes, one of them was killed by the other and then devoured. Flippinek. Even if the others are currently alive, Corypheus made no contact with any of them. He does not know if any of them have ever managed to leave the Black City and return safely and considers them a lost cause. Now of course we do know that the Architect, he's probably still alive. He was originally going to be in Dragon Age Inquisition, so whether you killed him or not in Awakening, I'd say the Architect is still out there too. But upon
upon his location, again, they're all scrambled throughout Fadis. Now, it's a real shame for me to read this incredible origin story of a twisted, morally grey villain, and then to see what we actually ended up with in Inquisition. It's just a bit underwhelming. Like, he was the first ever Magister who kicked off this hubris plan to open the heavens, and yet he doesn't tell us anything about it. He just treats us like a dog because he's, quote, better than us, end quote. It's like, damn, we could have learned a ton, ton, ton of lore from him. Instead of his just stupid, pretentious, monologuing dribble, he could have at least told us about the origin of the Blight, the Darkspawn, the Fade Solas, the flipping Golden or Black City, depending on what you believe. But nope, nothing. Like, he could have at least said something. I don't expect him to sit down and give us a whole mentoring session about why the world is what it is, you know. He's not supposed to be a psychologist, but he could have at least said something about the Blights, about the Maker, about the old gods, but he just declared it all fake and said that, no, bow to the will that is Corypheus. It's like, no, tell me something I don't know. I don't want a 2D villain. I want a fully enraptured plot with a developed dimensional villain. Not to spoil and not to ramble for a second, but you see movies like Avengers Infinity War and Star Wars The Last Jedi, and it's those moments when the antagonist is talking to the protagonist and they're sharing their motive and they're trying to allow them to understand, and it defines it. It's incredible. It makes us see the antagonist completely different. Exactly what Solas did at the end of the Trespasser DLC. But it's like, why couldn't we have that for Corypheus? I want to see him again in Dragon Age 4, kind of like just a head, like in the fade, like say like his entire body is completely gone and he's like half sentient and all of his memories are kind of scrambled, but he remembers the Black City completely and the entire experience of that. And I want to walk up to him in the fade as a mage or whatever, and I want to be able to talk to him about it all, and I want him to tell me it without being a pretentious, stupid milk drinker. I want him to carefully explain it all and why he thinks we're better than him, or why he seeks a demise to religion, or why the Golden City is the way it is, or about the Blights, or about the Titans, or about the Elves, or whatever. But alas, I did complain a lot in my previous Corypheus video. In any event, I really do enjoy the story of Cepheus Alamadis, and I will definitely be talking about Corypheus again in other videos. But I love seeing his call to action and why he felt he needed to usurp the very heavens for a higher purpose. Just like Solas and the Veil, Cepheus did it because he believed he was in the right. He was serving a higher purpose, a god. He wanted to meet his maker. I could get into it, and again, I probably will in another video because I have so much to say on this stupid, blighted Corypheus. But for now, this video is probably way too long. But Cepheus basically has similar parallels to Solas, being a little trickster and doing what he feels is just right for the world. And I really enjoy that. I like seeing those parallels to the Dread Wolf because we do have a developed dimensional character within Solas. So I'm excited for his story and I'm excited for that. So if anything, again, like I mentioned in my previous video, Corypheus, if nothing, helped build up the villain that is the Dread Wolf. Or I should say, contagonist that is the Dread Wolf. But regardless, guys, tell me down below what y'all think about the origin story of Corypheus that turned this pompous magister Cepheus Alamadis into the wicked conductor of the Silent Choir, the vile monster that is Corypheus. I want to know what you're thinking down below. I apologise if this video was a bit too long. I just love to ramble, y'all. But anyhow, that'll do it for me. Do tell me all your thoughts down below. But for all your things, Bioware, Dragon Age, Mass Effect, and for me, a few of IPs, maybe Life is Strange, I don't know, I haven't thought about it yet. All that jazz, you're already in the right place. Be sure to check out my blog if you want to get more of the Jackdaw. And if you want to buy one of my shirts and support me, well, I'd love you forever. And also my patrons, I just love you anyway, of course. But anyway, guys, I've been Jackdaw. And I should go. Whoa, 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 whoa.